Hello, I'm Steven Robinson, or the uh, play typer guy, as my son calls me. And um, I'm happy today to have my friend, author, and playwright, Laramie Dean, with me on um, what's going to be a more fun filled occasion where we were going to do sort of a Halloween themed edition of the podcast. And um, unfortunately, uh, earlier this week, we learned that the great uh, Lara Parker, who um, played uh, Angelique on Dark Shadows had passed away. Um, played is actually sort of not giving her her due. Uh, she sort of created this icon. And um, yeah, so Laramie, what are some of your thoughts? I know when you heard this news and... Oh, it was... <sighs> Devastating isn't quite the right word because I don't handle death very well. It was it was shocking. And then I thought, gosh, she was almost 85. She had cancer. We just found that out. Um, but it was still such a shock. I, I had just been telling my husband that I have three 60s divas left. I had Laura Parker. I have Julie Newmar. And I have Barbara Eden. Um, having lost Elizabeth Montgomery 25 years ago in high school. And I thought, gosh, you know, when these women go and they're all in there, well, I think Barbara Eden is 90 something, Julie Newmar is, if she isn't 90, she's almost 90. Um, I thought it's going to be hard. And it, and it was, it was a hard day. It was a really hard day. Yeah. And um, I mentioned this online where uh, my mother, as I'm, I'm sure you're aware, was one of those, uh, the teens who rushed home to watch Dark Shadows uh, in the 60s. And uh, she was always sort of uh, into horror and sci-fi and everything and kind of passed that along to me, uh, specifically Dark Shadows. So it's been about 35 years since I started watching it with her when it started airing in our local affiliate. And to sort of put in a context of where so many of those actors were not much older, some even younger than we are now, I think, um, and that changed so quickly and um, the time does catch up with you. Um, <laughs> I remember watching those early, you know, and I was hooked from the start, those early black and white editions, the, um, the stories of Barnabas, but my mother was always saying, just wait until Arnie <laughs> comes. She was such a, a fan of that performance and that character. And I think she comes along at a time where the TV show Dark Shadows does something completely revolutionary, which is to sort of do an extended flashback in the 18th century to sort of show how their breakout character, Barnabas Collins, had become a vampire. Um, I've always been, and I think you are as well, pretty protective of Dark Shadows. I usually chafe when people call it campy or goofy. Mm. It was revolutionary first time, really pushing boundaries of what it could do in one day, even sort of in technical terms, um, you you know, the, the camera angles compared to a normal uh, soap opera of the period. And in many ways, like if you were to take one of your students um, and show them Dark Shadow, it would seem far more of a modern type of TV show and how it's storytelling, especially the serialization of it, than even Star track, which is kind of like, okay, well, we're done with episodes for the season. There's no cliffhanger. I mean, we don't, we don't, do, we don't do that. Whereas, um, you know, this show really does push the boundaries uh, uh, and so forth. And really beginning with um, Angelique's introduction, um, when in that first episode, as you recall, uh, which now exists only in a sort of a kinescope, so it's in black and white, even though oh, they moved the cover at that point. Um, and she is sort of new. She's the only actor so far they can see it had been that all the former actors had to come back and were playing their either ancestors or in Grayson Hall's case, a sort of Let's just have her play another campy broad. Um, Pseudo reincarnation, pre pre incarnation. <laughs> uh, it's it's it was really disappointing that that episode is is lost in its its color uh, format. I mean, we we get 
lots of close-ups of, of Laura Parker's eyes <laughs> in episodes to come. But I, I think that moment where she's standing in the doorway and she's just dewy, like she's literally wet from the road, but she's also like young and blonde and 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 pretty. And like you said, she's um, a, a unfamiliar face. She's she's not um, one of the regular cast members, as far as we know. And when she meets Joshua Collins, Barnabas's father, and she's curtsying, and, and uh, then she walks toward the camera, and she has that kind of <laughs> like almost smug cat that ate the canary look on her face. It is such a bummer that it doesn't exist in color. <laughs> um, and she's astonished, and, and 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 she's astonishing, and she's what she pulls off in that we don't know who she is or what her relationship was. It soon escalates an episode. She has a past relationship with uh, Barnabas at that point, but um, no, we don't even know she's a witch. No, <laughs> she's just, she's, she's a servant. And it's such a, um, it, it is so, uh, so much fun. I mean, um, Lara Parker, who was born uh, Mary Lamar Ricky and from Knoxville, Tennessee, um, is in from a prominent Southern home, her sort of Southern bearing voice comes through. Um, I know later versions of Dark Shadows will try to kind of lean into the fact that her backstory is she's French. Um, mm. And there's even a somewhat hilarious scene later where they have Lara Parker and Catherine Lee Scott, who was playing Josette, try to speak in French for a bit. <laughs> We're never going to do this again. Um, but, you know, to me, it, that southernness, as a southerner myself, that southernness sort of comes through from the start. So a lot of the arch looks and so forth that she presents. And she seizes the story, um, it's definitely from um, the normie uh, Victoria Winters <laughs> at that point, who had been cast back in the past. She was just a vehicle to get us in the past. The storyline from that point, its propulsion is entirely Angelique. It is a, I've compared it to Shakespeare, that first story, because it's so much, and she's this, tra you know, I, you know, she's sort of the tragic Shakespearean lead, protagonist of that story, of what she wants, her motivation, um, and I've always find that more appealing in our quote unquote villains, her motivation is positive in the sense that she doesn't want to necessarily, she doesn't, it's kind of clear she doesn't want the wealth, the name, so forth, and people have speculated otherwise. But to me, it's like she loves this guy. She just wants that's Barnabas. Cool. She just the wants the guy, guy. That's all. Yeah. Um, and also everybody dies at the end of the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Litter the stage is littered with bodies, including um including her own <laughs> uh, one of the one of the most oh, not gruesome necessarily but it kind of is angelique's death scene where mm. barnabas strangles her and and you know they've they've spent however many weeks four or five weeks building her up to be pretty unstoppable and then they turn Barnabas into a vampire and, and he's terrifying. He's shaggy and yeah. green and and uh, he strangles the hell out of her, drops her onto the ground and she's staring blindly into oh, nothing. Yes. They cram um, her into the box and then they open the box and she's still staring blindly <laughs> into nothing. I, um, terrifying. It's interesting you mentioned this. I have that clip. It's literally one of my favorites and I want to before I play it, I do want to state the dramatic irony, how great this is of what they, those writers had done because Barnabas Collins had exploded. He was this, he was the, the main bad guy that we loved and enjoyed. We went back and we saw a different version of him. He was human. He was kind of a chump in certain ways. He was like- <laughs> His we, hair like, went forward. <laughs> yeah, like all the sort of, it wasn't necessarily, we were shown evidence that it wasn't an act. He was never this sort of always in control villain who, when he went to the, um, Collinwood and pretended he was this nice kind of shy guy, that was an act. That was sort of a part of him that still existed, but he had become this monster and we didn't see it. And sort of it's building. And I remember as a kid watching us, wanting to see the vampire again, right? Like, when are we gonna get to see the vampire? When are we gonna get to see the vampire? <laughs> and when is he gonna come back? And then 
they delay it to the point where when it starts to, it becomes tragic. We don't want him to be cursed. And, and we don't, we, now the, the, the lore is such that obviously Angelique is the one who curses him. You didn't know how it happened. You didn't really know the role she was playing. And so- I wonder how many people sense. figured that out. You know, how many people saw that coming? It, it seems, I mean, I don't know. I, I started watching Dark Shadows when I was eight or nine back in the eighties um, with some of the black and white episodes. Uh, but I also saw, I'm pretty sure I saw the House of Cards, the Angelique burning the House of Cards episode on PBS. I, I would always see these just randomly. And then I started to fill the pieces in when the, the 1991 series came along and I was having episode guides and uh, concordances and all those things in the sci-fi channel. But I wonder how many people who watched it originally, and I've never asked anybody this, if they knew, if they put those pieces together, oh, here's this new character and she's a witch and she can do these things, is she going to somehow be responsible um, for Barnard's going to becoming a vampire? Because in most movies and stories, it, you're bitten by another vampire. Um, we don't know how Dracula became a vampire. We don't really know. Uh, but for the most part, you are bitten by another vampire. And I, I just am curious now oh, yeah. to know like how many people figured, oh, it's going to be Angelique. She's going to be responsible. And she places this curse uh, in this really amazing scene. She had fruit, mm. again, we're following her. She had manipulated everyone, was running the table, again, like like Macbeth, where he's, we shouldn't enjoy what he's doing, but he's running it, he's doing <laughs> it, right? He and his wife are getting there. And she, so for those of you who are nerdy like me and study that structure, she is building up, she's getting everything, she has everything she wants. She's married to him, she's in the old house, and then it just starts to kind of, fall apart and there's the moment of sort of desperation she's about to lose what she which all she wanted was him and she's about to lose that then there's the fight which a, a, a verbal fight but altercation barnabas is like i'm done i'm leaving he does try to stab anymore. her at least once he, yes he um <laughs> there was almost some comedy dark comedy of where multiple attempts to try to kill her that were failing <laughs> And then some farce, uh, some vampire farce. <laughs> but then she has the voodoo doll. She's going to kill uh, his sister. She's gonna if you don't stay, you know. He shoots her, and he, and she he she collapses. And again, um, not that I advise. I love my wife. I would never shoot her. But my advice though, <laughs> is that you don't let you just leave the room and let her die. Don't kind of let her monologue. <laughs> She has a good monologue. He's sort of standing there like, oh, you know. She's so there. many missed opportunities to stop her from talking. You're like, buddy. He just stands there and is like, so <laughs> I can't believe you're saying this. And so she drops the boom, which is the curse is that, you know, everyone who loves you will die. It's sort of a poetry mm. to the curse. Not just you're going to be, a, she doesn't. She just says, she says no one time. says the V word for a while. She does. She's the first to say it. I'll show that clip mm -hmm. in a second as well. And so then the bat comes in. And and again, I get so mm. I get so frustrated when people talk about, oh, look, the bat looks goofy. They've shown this clip and it's been frustrating because it's been scenes where they've had they've been on talk shows, would be Jonathan Fred and Lara Parker, or whatever, and they show that clip. And they've done this great work, this great scene, and you get this goofy talk show host saying, "Look, you can see the string on the." Ugh. It's so ignore the bat. Dark it's Shadows so fans are really good at ignoring. Like we become very good at just not seeing the. You know, you. I, I guess I would say you pay attention more to the pathos and the drama and the melodrama than you do to the bat on a string. Because but if that's all you want to pay attention to, yeah, you're not going to enjoy it. Exactly, and it's a good. It's a good stage. I mean, Dark Shadows was theater, live on tape. Having worked in the stage, it's a good stage prop. If you were mm -hmm. if you were on stage and seeing that, you say, like, "Oh, this is pretty cool." Um, he's bitten. He died, you, and we think, "Okay, well, now this is it. He's been bitten by the bat, and he's killed Angelique." And then there's the great scene. Um, ben, uh, who was Barnabas's friend, servant, uh, had been enslaved by Angelique. He, you know, takes Barnabas's room. You think she's done. Then the door swings open. Ta -da. And she's there <laughs> holding her where she's been stabbed and or shot rather. And she's like, okay. then again, our sympathies with her because she's like, 
okay, well, I might have made a teen, I might have <laughs> overreacted. Tiny tactical error. <laughs> so we need to make sure he doesn't die. So the rest of it is her like <laughs> trying to keep him alive, which again, at this point, the dramatic irony is descending because we know, anyone watching knows, no, she's going to fail, but our sympathies are still with her. Then he, of course, he does die. And at that point, she's like, okay, well, we have to kill him. So I'm going to show those two, first of two clips. The first with her and Ben. Got me so befuddled, I don't know what to think. I know he's dead, but, but you say. I never heard of a man rising from his coffin. Do you know the word vampire, Ben? Vampire? Open the casket. No, <laughs> leave him be. It's getting dark, open it. No. He'll come to life, you won't be, you won't be safe. But... If he comes to life, he'll settle you. Um, and um, no one had said the word vampire at that point. Um, there's legends, again, lo perhaps lost to lore as to why was it a censor issue, whether they're trying not to overtly be a horror show by saying vampire, <laughs> but it did seem to have existed in a world where no one knew what vampires were because you would have like Maggie Evans saying, you know, he's a creature from the world of the dead, or they saying he's like not alive. He can walk at night, but he's dead. As if like it's a parlor game, or you can't use the word vampire. Right. Um, right. They use the word undead a lot. They use the word undead with um, Laura Collins, and then oh, I'm 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 watching. I've been watching it at one episode every morning since the intro of Barnabas back in July, and I got this morning to the Dr. Woodard stuff where he, they get fake Dr. Woodard and mm -hmm. he discovers uh, Barnabas is a vampire and he's, you are the undead. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. That's fine. Vampire is a bridge too far until now, until now. Um, and oh God, they all look so young in that clip. They all look so young. And you know, again, this is just 21 years earlier when I was watching this, it was only, 21 you know the x-files turns 30 this year so <sighs> just to put in perspective of how close <laughs> i was to that world when i just started now it's much much time has passed so and this is one of my favorite scenes of the show so let's so you tell me what has happened to me and what i must do about it <laughs> angelique look at me and tell me made you one of the living dead. But you can live only at night. When the sun rises, you must return to your coffin until the sun sets again. And what about the rest of the curse? You said that anyone who loved me would die. I tried to lift the curse, Barnabas. I did everything in my power. But you could not. No. So the curse is with me yet and will remain with me. Now I know why you tried to prevent me from coming back to life. You do? Of course. You knew you would be the first victim of your own curse. No, no, that's not true. Of course it is, Angelique. Or were you always lying to me when you told me how much you loved me? No, Barnabas. I do love you. Then, according to the curse, you must die. No, Barnabas, please. Yes, my dear Angelique. No! Oh, your powers of witchcraft are going to save you now. <laughs> the blood running out the corner of her now you know it's such a missed opportunity and the other attempts to redo dark shadows and i know you've talked uh at some length about this with, with uh, danny horn on his his um blog dark shadows every day and i love the 91 series i do um but it is such a missed opportunity how the way that they treat angelique in every other iteration they've ever done uh 
I love the dramatic irony of her saying, or of him saying to her, you'd be the first victim of your own curse. And she's like, that's not true. And then, and, and down she goes. It really gives more depth to the character. She's far less of a fatal attraction uh, uh, psycho character. Um, and you feel bad for her. <laughs> it also yeah. makes Barnabas way scarier. Like Angelique has to be scary so that vampire Barnabas can be scarier. And I remember watching these um, on the Sci-Fi Channel in the summer of 93 when they aired them. And how scary they made it sound. That whole episode where uh, Angelique is preparing for to stake Barnabas and she's fighting with Joshua and she's ordering around Ben and she's terrified. And, and, and it makes the audience feel scared too. Um, considering we haven't seen Barnabas as a vampire for <laughs> for several weeks, but um, yeah, she's he was... looking out the window like it's a rainy day. She kind of yeah! just and it's like the the tension, and we know she's going to fail, which I always love when. And this is a you know Hitchcockian thing, it's whatever. But it's like when we know someone's still going to fail, we still want them to succeed. That sort yep. of counter uh, the tension. And you're right. I mean, later versions. They, I think, tend to lean more into the fatal attraction, more into the sexuality aspect of it. Laura Parker, of course, was a stunning woman, very sexy. That, But it was sort of an intelligence to her, a, kind of a classic. And her introduction is so key for it. When you talk, you can't talk about the show without her because mm -hmm. Barnabas, aside being a breakout character, you know, and I've debated this, with, again, with Danny Horn um, as well about, you know, to the degree to which Dark Shadows, in a way, stopped being a soap opera. Like, and he contends it's always been a soap opera, sort of still had the tropes. But and it was this weird thing where, yes, it was, but it got to a point where instead of like soap operas where you could miss episodes, storylines didn't really matter, no one referred back, it became, even more so now, such a modern series where it's like you're referring to story arcs like you do on Buffy like oh this is the right this is With the, the big season bad. Where goes, this is the big bad season yeah. okay well this is yeah Angelique's the big bad this is 1795 then we get this the Nicholas the big bad the, this you know Toffee, foretelling, yeah. foretelling that type of storytelling um and yeah I mean what it is a key thing of soap operas is the super couple and Barnabas was not part of a super couple until Angelique arise and that chemistry that Fred and Lara Parker had together because Fred had zero chemistry with you know the other ladies um <laughs> Alexandra Moltke as um mm. Victoria Winters or or Maggie Evans as Josette um there's no point where you know it's very hard to even root from to be with Josette <laughs> because it's like I don't get this whereas I kind of well I think you won yes yeah, she's a witch but you can't have everything and <laughs> That's like Fred's lifestyles. Uh, like, you're good. She I'm, said she'd give it up. Come on, dude. Exactly. She, said she'd, she said she'd throw away her allegiance to Beelzebub. <laughs> um, so that becoming this sort of super couple, which is a big thing in, in soap operas, and that's sort of a key, and that becomes sort of the core relationship of the series. Um, and so when we leave 1795, and we feel very sad, that she's gone, but not forever, because in one of the more famous Dark Shadow lines, he says, um, well, yes, I killed her. I didn't say she was dead. Uh, <laughs> and um, she comes back. She's sort of, um, at this point, her um, her theme, her motif um, is actually, it's called Seance, for anyone who has the Dark Shadows uh, soundtrack or uh, and but that had existed long before Angelique. It usually just played at any time. There was sort of a spooky moment, but she claims it. At that point, it's her Imperial March. Like, so whenever, <laughs> so you, they, they were using it to even let us know Angelique's in the room, Angelique is thinking. And uh, there's a great scene later where um, Joshua and uh, Natalie are in the old house attempting to try to summon someone to cure Barnabas and they look and there's this random portrait 
on over the fireplace mantle, it shimmers, the music starts to play, and it's replaced <laughs> by Angelique's image, which is such a baller move. And um <laughs> and that music meant they didn't pay Lara Parker for the day. <laughs> exactly. It's like we've got your we have your image. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> ooh, 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 ooh. It presages this idea that the studios want to do with AI. Oh god. <laughs> Um, it's horrifying, horrifying. Yes, and so yeah, but we do get her back. So I'd like to move on to the 1968 storyline. So what is your mm. thought on how she was brought back and how she was <sighs> during um, in the modern day? I am such a fan of her hair. <laughs> it's probably the gayest part of me is my obsession with all the different hairstyles of Angelique. Um, I have a blog, Shadows on the Wall blogzine.com something something and i did a i did a series a couple years ago the fits and fashions of 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 angelique in every era because there's always going to be a place for her from now on in every era she'll show back up and disappear and show back up again um and i'm such a fan of that ridiculous trope in 60s television to take a blonde leading actress and slap a dark wig on her and and call her a cousin in Bewitched's case or a sister in Adrian Genie's case. I just loved it when I was a kid. I love the idea that you can put um, a different hair color on a woman and maybe some different eye makeup and she's totally different. And to be fair, I did not recognize uh, Barbara Eden or Elizabeth Montgomery for years when I was a kid. I, I thought Serena and Genie 2 were I don't know, separate actresses? I don't know if I was thinking about it that deeply. <laughs> But my, are you my, really fooled by glasses or <laughs> so simple? My favorite, my favorite, favorite, favorite image um, from Dark Shadows is the very famous one of um, Cassandra and Adam and Barnabas and Nicholas Blair all looming over Vicky, and she's going, <gasps> but and, and this picture of, of of Cassandra with the the wig on it was probably the first. When I when I was a kid, my best friend's mother had been a, a run home from school kid, and she had all the '60s magazines and scrapbooks. And she had the, which cut it up, but she had the afternoon TV that has the Angelique vampire and Barnabas behind her picture, and um, a bunch of a bunch of these old articles. And I, the first picture of Angelique I saw was. Uh, she's her fangs and she's, it's a little tiny picture from a teen magazine and she's a vampire going her. And then the, the, the Alexander Mulkey, Vicky Winters picture with all the monsters looming over her. And I just thought this chick is so cool. Like she just looks so badass standing there doing the Kubrick stare. And uh, I I was like I want and I like her armless. I like her mini sleeve. I got it. It's, I keep looking. It's framed. It's framed over here. <laughs> because of um, course it is. I don't think most folks who would be listening to a uh, Lara Parker a memorial uh, <laughs> podcast would be aware of the storyline. But just for anyone who one yeah. of my regular listeners, um, at this point, Barnabas is supposedly cured. Um, Roger. Uh, has been acting weird because he's gotten he's purchased this old portrait that is obviously Angelique, and um, then he vanishes and he comes back and he is now married and it's clearly Lara Parker as you said with the the wig <laughs> monstrosity this first monstrosity of a wig. <laughs> and, <laughs> they used to advertise um, them in the back of '60s magazines like you could order one of these for yourself if you wanted to. And she's sort of deliciously torturing Barnabas. It's sort of um, because, and I think Cassandra, I don't know if it's intentional or not, because this idea that everyone, Barnabas and Julia at this point, um, even Vicky is like, I think this might be Angelique and no one believes them. And she then um, says, I'm going to recurse Barnabas, but through a dream, which is a long and tedious dream. I, I know people have <laughs> issues with the dream curse, but I, for the purposes of this, I'll just say it just, it's so in character for her because it is so melodramatic. Like it's just going to be slow <laughs> torture. Everyone, but it's like, an, you know, and it's also something that we've seen in horror films, like The Ring or other things of like, oh, totally. You know, a curse that's being, you know, and you can't escape it. It's going and going, except through a, a loophole because of how Barnabas was cured. The the um 
the curse gets to him. He has a dream. He dies, but he doesn't become a vampire and he actually doesn't permanently die. Um, <laughs> they, which leads to um, <laughs> one of the sillier moments where Willie <laughs> and um, Julia are having to explain why they were almost going to bury Barnabas in the backyard. <laughs> Without telling anyone. <laughs> yeah. No, but we that well, and then everyone just like, oh, well, oh, all right. The weird and like, whatever oh, the point of that was, wouldn't he just like claw his way out of the box or like, they had missed out of the box? They didn't think they that had far. His forehead. Um, <laughs> so, um, and I love this show is, so much. A lot of mm. stuff is happening at this point. Um, but at this point, the true sort of big bad of that story arc nicholas blair has returned um originally seemed to be hinting that he was satan then later they kind of said well he can't really have him be satan so he's kind of like um a middle manager to satan <laughs> um it's a job great. i want by the way yeah. i want that job i'd like to be the middle manager in hell please somebody hire me and he's I'll a great that. um you know he's a great sort of sm smarmy soap opera villain um and uh he um, discovers how Barnabas has avoided the curse, which was um, through their sort of knockoff Frankenstein monster because they shared a quote unquote life force. But he doesn't want to kill Barnabas because he wants to keep the Frankenstein monster alive and then rule the world. His motivation was <laughs> less because rule the world tends to be less impressive uh, to me. So. Um, <laughs> But Bar but Angelique's not having it. She wants to, so she shows up with an axe to try to kill Adam. Uh, Nicholas is not pleased, so he strips her of her powers. And this is one of her, this is her second death that she won't get over. But there's a scene, and this is a, I'll show, a, this is a very brief clip between her and Barnt, where she confesses that the whole time that it's actually the wig. Love the wig. Love this scene. One word after. Such a long history between us. One word can end 200 years of pain. Why didn't you ever love me? Cassandra. You call me Angelique. And tell me why you never loved me. I love Josette. I hate you. You've proven that. Not successfully. <laughs> there are always people who will dare to say that Lara Parker looks terrible in a black wig. And these people are idiots. She looks fantastic <laughs> with black hair. And they finally got it. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's shellacked to filth. So it's super shiny. But I don't know. I'm looking at her going, God, she looks good with black hair. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> people are wrong. Well, I also love that her disguise is... You know, because as you mentioned with um, Genie 2 or um, Serena, um, the the bad or naughty version <laughs> had black hair, the idea that black is bad or whatever. Um, in this case, she is actually the evil version of her is blonde. Um, and that is such a, a compelling moment. Their scenes together, again, Barnabas and Angelique, uh, one of my favorite lines of his is when he says, you know, you've proven that, that everything. <laughs> well, um, now and, she gets to shoot him. That's what's great. It's like, she's turned the tables on him. I, I got the gun now, sucker. And also, yes. I don't have to reload mine. I can shoot it multiple times. <laughs> exactly. He's got the 18th, he had the 18th century version that was, um, and, um, but their, their, their tension together, she um, would li will come back as a um, vampire in which, and I think she was playing a vampire when she appeared on the Johnny Carson show. So I think that there are a lot of people who might think of her as predominantly a vampire, I think because that was one of her big scenes. And that picture, all those pictures of her, like the one in front of the portrait, that's really famous. Um, and I, I wonder how I wonder how confusing that was to people back in the day. Cause I mean, people who don't know Dark Shadows or they know it a little bit, they know Barnabas is a vampire. Quentin is a werewolf, Julia is a doctor, and Angelique is a witch. Like you essentialize them to these these monster identities, or I guess in Julia's case, doctor, mad mad scientist. Um, but Angelique, I mean, she spent a good half a year as a vampire, right? I mean, I feel like it was a big chunk of time. 
It's such a missed opportunity, though, too, because they didn't, they spent so much time keeping her and Barnabas apart, where you get those payoff scenes, like the the one you just showed is such a lovely scene where they, after four months of pointless subterfuge, <laughs> they finally get to have this confrontation, which pays off beautifully. But I think they realized around 1897 storyline that Angelique and Barnabas work best when they're fighting, when they actually oh, yeah. can, can be masks off and she becomes her whole thing then becomes bargaining she starts making bargains um with victoria winters in the past and then she never stops bargaining and they are sort of it's in certain cases almost like not it's not a screwball comedy but like in classic group you know the idea of the exes who still love each other but are ups you know they have those tension-filled scenes where there's sexual tension, but it's not unresolved because the presumption they've had sex because they've, <laughs> mar- they've been married, right? Um, and um, but yes, I know um, yeah. with her as the vampire, there was a very compelling, um, and I didn't want to load this with scenes, but I love the scenes where she um, destroys essentially uh, Joe Haskell, and <laughs> given what we know of. Um, the actor who, who was gay, it is incredibly coded as a kind of self-loathing gay relationship, which on the surface seems weird, like, oh my God, I must go and fool around with Lara Parker. Oh, I hate myself. <laughs> but all of that language, what he says about himself and how he hates himself and he's lost everything, but all he has left is her. And it's really that sort of subtext is compelling. Um, there's another great line of this, the show is so many great caddy lines. And he, he says like, you've ruined my life. You don't even care. She's like, not especially, not especially. <laughs> just like, and he's like, he like dabs himself with a letter opener. Like, the letter, like, Put that letter opener down. You sound ridiculous. He's <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> ridiculous. And he does a farcical because she needs to get him out of the house. And she brings in Barnabas who at this point she has under her control. And he's like looming. And Barnabas is I, what I love about this character. And again, I think other versions don't really get is the sort of, in a weird way, if you're going to centralize the characters, Quentin, because I have a kid around this age, he's Quentin is sort of like parentally the 10 to 12, the kind of nine to 12 year old kid who's really, you know, cute and hot. You know, everyone links his kid as cool and whatever, like that sort of <laughs> coolness. And uh, Barnabas is kind of the sort of, um, really awkward teen <laughs> as a kid i always identified with like his his dramatic monologues is like as long as i exist i will hate this room which is a real line as long as i exist i will hate this room and what it's done to me which i've often said at certain points because it's such a ridiculous lot but it's so true to him as a drama queen and so he's sitting there <laughs> over joe's body as joe is bleeding out he's like is this going to happen to me someday will i be on the and you're gonna drag me out over? of the woods you would and wouldn't you he's just like will you just get rid of this body i don't have time for this <laughs> and she doesn't deny it that's what's hilarious when he's like you would wouldn't you and she's like uh. yeah of course just, guess we'll we find just, out can we just focus on right now um but she does love him they do have the scene later where she just talks about the pledge that they made together and he Fred delivers a very sort of sheepish, like, I I made no pledge, and she has... A Not all pledges are made with words, exactly. <laughs> Uh Yeah. <laughs> you, um, you might have made a commitment there. And so, um... And yeah, so there's... We get to 1897, which I mean is sort of a platonic ideal of the character, where she's sort of constantly bargaining she is sort of a <laughs> i want to say sort of a chaotic sort of a character but i remember um uh M- michelle gomez is a great actor who had recently played yeah. um a version of the master on uh doctor who and it's one of my favorites because she was unpredictable she wasn't like hey show up i'm going to I hate the doctor, hate the doctor, and I'm going to do everything to destroy the doctor. She's like, no, we're buddies sometimes, but maybe I'll try to trick you into killing one of your best friends, or maybe I will do that. <laughs> like, 
or maybe I'll save your life. You know, she was unpredictable and that was made her always interesting to watch. And maybe she would help him or maybe she wouldn't. And then I feel like later when that character left and they, they recast and it's another Matt, it's reverting to the mean of, oh, he just hates the doctor and wants to destroy things. And so that becomes not interesting because there's only right. one response to anything. And so what I um, really liked about um, Angelique starting with 1897 was the fact that she was unpredictable. Like she, it seems, it seems like it's around the time that Laura Parker starts to have a lot of fun. I mean, she, she's talked before in interviews about how she wanted to play the heroine, she wanted to play the princess. And Frid was like, You're the heavy, <laughs> act like the heavy. And this is around the time that, that scene, uh, her first episode back in 7 Eleven or 7 12. And she pops out of the fireplace and she immediately handles Evan Hanley, who's played by um, Humbert Allen Estrada, who's the same actor that played Nicholas Blair, who was subjugating her all the way through 1968. So it's very fun to watch her not even need a doll or a hand gesture. He just starts choking because she wants him to choke. And it's kind of the same for the rest of the storyline. She gets to fight Patofi. She gets to fight Laura Collins. Uh, and she goes down a little bit sometimes, but she always pops back up again. And I, I think by that point, um, it, you know, it reminds me a lot of uh, before uh, Catwoman was had her own magazine, and she would pop up from time to time in the '60s TV series or in comic books. And I always liked her more when there was less of her, if that makes any sense. And mm -hmm. I think Angelique in 1997, because it's such a long storyline, it's like one of the longest ones. It's nine nine or ten months. And Laura Parker was obviously off doing a show or a play or something midway through because she disappears for like six weeks. <laughs> this interminable time without Angelique. Yeah. But it makes me appreciate the little moments because whenever she pops back in, she does something interesting. And she fights and fiddling the with on the Phoenix. Quentin is also fun. So her being the one who <laughs> actually destroys the Phoenix, she's the one who helps uh, Quentin. Um, you know, free um, Edward and Jameson from Patafi Spells in one of my favorite episodes. But let's watch that first scene of hers where she, uh, a decade before Darth Vader, mind you, is force choking a fool. A <laughs> lawyer. I don't think so. Well, I do. We know nothing about you. There's nothing you need to know. Except that I have some very mysterious powers, which I'll be glad to demonstrate for you. I am not interested in that. Perhaps someday you will be. I also have a very convenient control over people. Perhaps you would like to see that. No, I would not love. Yes. What is it you were saying, lawyer? <coughs> you have to come a little closer. It's difficult to understand you. Come closer. What have you done to him? <laughs> Nothing more than I do with my friends when they annoy me. With my enemies, I can be even more ruthless. Do you believe me, Quentin? I believe you. Oh, yes, I believe you. And might I suggest that uh, you release him? Whatever you say. After all, we're all on the same side, aren't we? My side. I may quote this scene more than I probably should. <laughs> Myself as well. Um, this was written, this episode was written by the great Violet Wells. Um, one of the, a woman who wrote for Dark Shadows wrote some of my favorite episodes, particularly um, with Count Batafi. And, and just so she has such a way of words. And she, in this just a minute, really gets to sort of the core aspects of what I say, my platonic ideal of Angelique, which is what, you know, working backwards. She, she's uh, always running her own agenda. And so she can have allies, as long as it's understood, we're all on the same side, my side. My side. <laughs> and uh, so everything is, she's, she can be an ally, but you are working with her within her own agenda. And um, she, uh, when he started, like, what are you doing? And Quentin's like, what are you, you know, he's choking uh, Nick, um, Evan, and she's like, nothing more than I do with my friends when they annoy me. With my enemies, I could be even more ruthless, which is such a great Violet Wells line, which is sort of um, 
like this is not a woman to be messed with. Um, no, and look how confident Laura Parker is. Not that she, I mean, compare this scene to the one you showed in the in the mausoleum where she's terrified and hoist on her own petard and 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 you know about to be strangled to death. This Angelique's doing the strangling, <laughs> you know, and, and I think Laura Parker is really starting to feel more confident. Um, I think at this point she'd been off the show, not for too long. It feels like, you know, the last time we see Angelique before this, she's, it's that w weird little 1795 flashback and she mm -hmm. kills Vicky or tries to kill Vicky and Barnabas and Ben torture. And that seems like the end. I mean, that really could have been the end of the character, her her story arc was was pretty filled, or pretty fulfilled. It seemed it seemed like she'd done all she could do, and so it must have been really fun to watch her come back. But yeah. I think it'd only been like three months. But it's the whole Quentin Ghost storyline oh, yeah. that, that she missed is she's not there, uh, which she comments on later, which I always love when Jameson recognizes her as Cassandra, and, and Quentin's like, "You were there." It's just like, "Yeah, before you got there." <laughs> afraid like i get around um <laughs> she, well, she, um, she is the episode guide right so exactly she's like. <laughs> very um but yeah i mean because it's a daily show and so you look at it, it's like yeah it's really like she left around november of 68 and then she's back maybe mid-march of 69 so it's not a very long time but yes it feels like a lot of story that she's been absent from and we really are excited <laughs> to see her again a surprise we actually don't know in fact the episode preceding that um for some background uh quentin and evan are uh trying to summon someone from hell to take on barnabas collins who um uh, is getting in the way of their you know uh financial spend. wizardry <laughs> exactly and um and uh it, it you know we see like a skeleton a skull face in the um fireplace and in the next episode um so that leads on that cliffhanger, that cliffhanger next episode episode starts, with starts with her laughter so she so, um has that sort of wonderful uh laughter which i think is a sort of also something that lara parker brought to it i think she'd always had of where she just would come into a room sometime or just be sort of amused by her own plan coming together <laughs> if that makes sense yeah um I, I i've always felt a little bad for lara parker having to do trot that laugh out for the last 40 years oh yeah <laughs> every um, dark shadows festival but she was so good at it you know and okay seriously for a second though um as i was working through my feelings because this woman and this character have been such a part of my life as a gay man growing up in a, a rural place in montana um to have this character when we get to the leviathan storyline i'll talk a little bit more about this too this idea of like reclaiming your power and um and to to suddenly have these realizations. I mean, I was thinking through it the other day. I loved the big finish um, CDs that they would put out, the, the the audio plays. And we won't get her anymore. And I always loved what they did with Angelique and them. I loved the bloodlust. I loved the um, the Cassandra Tony mysteries. I loved all of that. And they're done. Like that. Re that really hit me. I think yeah. on. Uh, Monday night, um, and I just went, ah, oh. <laughs> was the sound that I made, I went, oh, you know, I mean, and it's nice, we had these things forever, we were lucky to get more after the show was done, but it just went, okay, this is, and, and maybe as Dark Shadows fans, we are now accustomed to getting more, I mean, mm. she wrote the books, the comic books, the, 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 various revivals like we get more we get more we get more we get more and you know she was a consistent presence so yes. i think I, yes. lived in new, I lived in new york in the mid 90s um so i had attended a couple and i was never really a i'm not a big convention type person but i had a friend whose father uh was involved in them and she said you should come and I said, all right so i went thinking at this time i'll just go and find some of the old vhs's i'm really middle-aged so at the time i'm looking for missing vhs's in my collection they, oh i can get some for five bucks um and um but so i wound up going in one in, in hearing her speak and she's just you know wonderful um uh, there was a moment where they're signing it's her and across the way is uh Catherine lee scott and they sort of wave at each other and kind of have a fun little we 
we're friends, which is sort of a great thing. We're seeing more of that now with like a lot of the, you know, um, conventions and and you know, things at Comic Con or whatever. So it's not unusual, like say the cast of Doctor Who of the new series will be still seeing in touch with each other and everything. But this was something where these they were coworkers and didn't necessarily end in 1971. They were still seeing each other sort of a regular, like once a week, uh, for, even if it's just once a week for a year, that maintains a relationship in certain mm -hmm. ways. Now that, you know, at my age, I sort of realized that. And um, yeah, she was, she was wonderful. She was part of that, of giving back as well, like writing things like the um, Angelique's descent and the books and the, um, um, being part of that so yeah it is a feeling of it's gone like you know beyond yeah. like sort of you know Jonathan Fred has stepped away he did come back for a couple towards the end of his life but the the involvement that she had had was so tremendous so yeah it's it's it is a sort of absence and um and it was a tough year for myself I a big fan of um Arlene Sorkin, even before she started playing uh, Harley Quinn, and she had yeah, she was on away. Days of Our Lives. Yes, yeah. um, I remember her as Calliope. My mom was a big Days of Our Lives fan, and I watched it, you know, growing up. And so when she was Harley Quinn, I was like, "Oh, yeah, that's Calliope from uh, you oh, know." Yeah. And nobody had any idea that that character. Well, I, I recognized her by set by my you know. I was such a fan that I recognized her as soon as she spoke as Harley Quinn. Yeah. Whereas it's, there are people who have a different, obviously, experience with that now. But for me, it was like, oh, wow, it's it's Calliope. It's Calliope. Um, it's Calliope. Um, similar Jean. to um, <laughs> my, I think, my mother flipping through channels one night and stopping and being like, oh, look, there's Eugene. And it's actually an episode of Star Trek Next Generation <laughs> of Star Trek. with Q. He was, he was Q, wasn't he? Yeah. Oh, so my was, God. Um, when I told my husband too, when I got home, because I don't, I don't deal with grief very well. I don't like to deal with grief, and I, um, I try to process it in artistic ways or creative ways. And I told my husband, I feel silly. I feel silly. I didn't know Laura Parker. We weren't friends. I'd met her a couple times. You know, she would pop on my Facebook or my Instagram occasionally and <laughs> write things, but I didn't know her. But then I was like, I have. So to the right of me is the painting of of um, Angelique from Night of Dark Shadows that friends of mine got for me and then my friend Amy framed. And then to the left of me is a giant poster of Night of Dark Shadows where she's hanging, she's dead, she's a skeleton mouth and she's making out with David Selby. It's like, the I think back there is a, a parallel time painting. So she's on my wall several times. Yeah, I think, <laughs> you, you know? know, there's a tendency to, I don't know, I don't necessarily think it's, more mature to have a sort of a transactional relationship with the people who bring art that's important to your life. So you could say like, oh, well, this stuff's still there. Why do I care? Right. Yeah. And and I think, but no, it's kind of in a weird way. It's like that they are out there and still, it's like, it's the least that we can do is to wish them well for all that they've done and, you know, in our lives and so forth. Making so, this impact. Oh, totally. Yeah. And um, definitely, you know, you feel that and the sense of it is like getting further away from something is just your own sense of mortality of like, really? Well, when you said that you're middle-aged, I mean, I'm going to be 45 in January. And I, I literally went the other day. Oh wait, that is, that is middle-aged. Like 45 is actual. <laughs> Like if you look at ninety as being around the stopping off point, then I was like, "Yep, <laughs> yeah, exactly." It's uh, right there. It makes you very aware of the stuff, yeah. the things of your childhood that were there that no longer. Well, and neither one of us should. I mean, I, I know we both have a deep appreciation for television and 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 film and characters of the past. I mean, if I was a, a normal if I was a normal kid from the the eighties, I wouldn't I wouldn't have watched Dark Shadows. I wouldn't have been as into Bewitched as I was, and it's it feels like a part of my childhood, even though it's from <laughs> ten years before I was born, which just seems so fifteen years before I was born, which just seems so funny to me now. But it feels like it's my childhood. Like these characters, these are a part of my growing up experience. It's oh, all right. wrapped up in in coming out and 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 reclaiming queer power and um, queer rage, which is a fun new term I learned mm -hmm. um, a couple of months ago that I really like. That I feel like 
Angelique embodies this idea of queer rage a lot. Um, Carrie from Stephen King's Carrie, you know, it's like you're a monster and you get wronged, but you don't have to sit back and take it because you can throttle a doll. Very much so, I think, because, um, you know, and we'll, I, I do want to go through the, the, the last year or so of her show on the show because I think it's important. I think it goes to your queer reading of this, but um, it was a show that I felt like I shared with my mother. It was, she was, you know, it passed down as that personal thing. And it was a major part of my life because, you know, and uh, Danny Horn has written about this. This is like a thousand episodes, right? It takes a while to watch <laughs> the whole thing. Um, and um, I remember my wife, on one of our, the first time she came to my apartment, um, when we were dating, she was like, just completely earnestly asking, um, what's Dark Shadows and why are there 26 of them? Because they were like, like, what could be, like, there's 20, like, what is this? Like, is it a cult or whatever? There's a lot of commitment as a 26 volume or something, right? Like, and they're thick, it's not just 26 movies. It's like these thick DVDs. It's like, you're, oh God, are the DVDs. Yeah, it's like, this ah. is huge, but it's a lifetime commitment. And you were talking about watching, I was in college. Uh, my first freshman year was when the Sci-Fi Channel debuted and started showing Dark Shadows. And one thing to sort of mention, a lot of these episodes had never been seen since, because it's very expensive to show, like, there's a thousand episodes. So I think early Barnabas, um, 1795, and then usually, so I think they had a deal for like about a year. And when that would peter out, so a lot of these shows were almost lost the ages until the Sci-Fi Channel. So, you know, when I was kind of my young teens and moved to New York and going to doing early theater jobs and watching or taping, have the stuff at the end of the night and watching stuff, it was around the same time, you know, they had not been seen in a long, long time. I was sort of experiencing them for the first time as many had. Um, but yes, yeah, so, at, you know, what did you think of Angelique's presence? People have argued that, you know, they were bringing Laura Parker back, but she was not as relevant to the plot lines in sort of like Leviathan and and so forth. I, I disagree. I think she plays a, a key role of like making stuff happen and her involvement with everyone. Well, and it's always interesting. Um, I, I struggle with the last year. Um, during COVID, I sat and I actually had never seen the entire thing all the way through. I'd seen most of the big stories. I'd never seen, I'd never seen 1841 parallel time. I'd never seen the first year. <clears throat> and I said, Hey, I'm going to do this. I have the coffin set. I have all the other DVDs and it's on, I think it was on two beer prime or something. And I did, I, I, I watched several episodes a day and I made it through the whole thing. Um, I'll probably never do that again. <laughs> I do skip. I struggle with the last year. This summer I tried to watch parallel time but fell apart so spectacularly that I was like, I don't know. Oh, yeah. um, you know, the last year is hard. It is hard. There's great moments. And I usually will skip to those moments. Um, but as far as Angelique is concerned, I, I'm a huge fan of Leviathan. I'm a huge fan of that storyline. It's so goofy. It's the, you know, the monster, every monster they can think of, they throw in there. There's some Lovecraft stuff. Um, and then there's Angelique. And again, she's not there very much. And so her absence makes me anticipate her appearances more. And my favorite episode is 9.55. Uh, summer of 94, uh, we were back staying on our farm. Uh, my mom was in law school. We would go back to our farm, which we had the sci-fi channel. Missoula didn't have the sci-fi channel at the time. So I only got to watch Dark Shadows at Christmas and in the summertime. And it was the Leviathan story. And I knew very little about it. I had... Um, those great MPI catalogs that used to come. I don't know if you ever got those. Uh, they would show up in the mail sometimes and they were huge and glossy and they had beautiful color pictures and they had little summaries, uh, little episode summaries. So that filled me in on a lot of stuff that I was missing because I didn't understand Angelique's timeline. I didn't really get the fact that she experiences the story in more or less the same order that the audience does. So she knows all these things until 1840. So Leviathan, um, Again, I'm such a fan of her hair. I did not realize that most of it was not real. I didn't realize that she has these great big long falls and they are 
they are clip-ons. I didn't realize this. I just thought it was beautiful hair. Um, she has great outfits. I mean, she's the she, she's playing Mrs. Rumson. She's the rich socialite that she always wanted to be, I guess. Uh, she gets these beautiful leopard coats and all this blue. And um, she gets more fights with Barnabas. She gets to have a little fight with Julia. So I, I, I guess in that period, I really love when she shows up. And she's playing Samantha Stevens. Some people have said they find her boring. I think she's interesting no matter what. Um, but that moment where Nicholas comes back and sends her husband, Sky to burn her up. And then she, oh, it's so heartbreaking. It's Laura Parker getting to actually play facets of this character who is not Glenn Close from um, whatever. Fatal uh, Attraction. Fatal Attraction. She's not Glenn Close from Fatal Attraction. She grabs the little doll he gave her and she chokes him into submission. She breezes back into the old house, kisses Quentin, hugs Barnabas, freaks out at Maggie. She gets all these great moments in 955. It's like the best of Angelique. Yeah. Um, and she gets to cast this love spell that goes back to 1795. For no real reason. They just have her decide she loves Barnabas again. I'm I'm here for it. Uh, and the can or the light sh shines on her face, and she turns green, and her eyes pop, and yeah, it's amazing. So well, that's sort of I'm, the through I'm line. Um, <laughs> I actually have I I have followed the shadows on the wall blog, and I think just now realized that is you. So oh good yes. <laughs> So I would love to know oh, this is very familiar. It's like, all right, I've been reading this, but I had no idea it was you. Um, Do you know so what I have done for eleven years, Stephen Robinson? I have made, I have made a comic strip, a daily comic strip using Microsoft Word and Microsoft Publisher. So you can take photographs and turn them into pencil sketches. And I am not proficient at any other kind of technological. Oh, yeah anything and so i have made 11 seasons um at least 1200 of these things and i'm still i made some more this morning i make seasons of that because I, I i told my or i'd ask myself what can my blog offer that like nothing else is out there so i started <laughs> making well, these yeah and it's fun well the queer That's reading me. and you and the queer reading you've been talking about you want to get back to the through line of there being in love yeah whatever. and i know some people don't like the resolution toward the end of 1840 that Barnabas loves her. But if you read this as a queer couple and that either of them are in certain ways. So at first she is wants to be with him and is fine being him despite what the world thinks. And he is someone who is trying to have this quote unquote normal life that we as an audience believe like, oh, I don't know, Josette's kind of dull they don't actually bother doing anything with Josette. That's interesting, right? So she <laughs> reads totally as like... The pretty straight girl that the, the guy you're sleeping with really wants to marry while he's having a DL relationship with you. Yep. I was having that around the time that I was watching this show, actually. So it really <laughs> super resonated yeah. with me. I, uh, I, oh, yeah. God. I'm Angelique and she's <laughs> Josette. I'm Angelique and I hate you. Just shout at her. I hate you. Yeah, shout that. You will beg for more than forgiveness when I am through with you. Uh, with you. Just, yeah, all these I lines I should not use regularly, but I do. Um, but I do. And I think that is sort of the through line. So when he confesses his love, and if you read it through that reading, it's not so much of like, wait a minute, like she just killed a bunch of people and you're finally coming around. What's going on? It is more <laughs> of like, it's also a moment for him as well, because they are sort of to coming sort of to gather and to not be sort of so dull and normal. And she tries, right? So she's also, you know, I've done all of this. Maybe I should just try to be normal. I've tried. And that's what she's doing with Sky, and that falls apart. He literally tries to destroy her, and she's like, "Okay, I'm done with it. Now I'm gonna just go back to my own thing. This is who I, I am, am. What I was, and what I will always be. Yes. I call upon the powers of darkness again. Boom. I am what I was, and I would always be. It's, it's such a beautiful line. Um, she, uh, Lara Parker gets a lot more to do in um, 1970 parallel time. She's sort of the dominant figure. Um, 
but similar to when she's sort of the the lead um the female lead in 1840 one parallel time the others she's not playing our angelique yeah not at all when she's playing Catherine Herridge. so she's um it is she's good but it's just not as engaging i mean i find it significantly less interesting and and i i, I do i enjoy parts of parallel time it doesn't make any sense um i like the costumes i like her hair again uh but it's, it, without that backstory without that sort of tragic pieced together backstory i think angelique from parallel time is less interesting and she's more driven without having a lot of that dimensionality if that's a word that i enjoy with um with angelique from the prime timeline and i think what's interesting about the show at this point is that they've now made everybody kind of stock like nancy barrett's char characters are going to be kind of psychic like all of them are kind of psychic from now on out uh, and they're going to put her with john carlin um Angelique is gonna lock Julia up in something. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of other examples, but I just feel like at this point they just are like they've settled into these patterns and they're not gonna really break out of them for the rest of the series. And that makes it less interesting to me too. I mean, Angelique is more than just a crazy bitch, for lack of a better term. And I think that in parallel time, she's kind of just that. Yeah, and, and plus her, a zombie. Her her motivation again is not because it's not love she returns it is just vengeance which is less yep. compelling and, way less compelling um, and i think um yes i mean our angelique is just far more interesting and i so i do think uh, it's fascinating some people don't like 1840 Angelique feeling like it's going backward but i do like it just sort of a back to basis basic storyline where it's them again and those great scenes of them again because it's Barnabas and Angelique with that history and to the point of where um, they can essentially reconcile and be together even of course ends tragically so um she's, um, shot again just shot again she gets shot this time you know no coming back um she's she's um she was great in that i do well the time i still have left with you i want to um what you know she one of the reasons she's sort of the main lead of of parallel time was because half the cast was off doing house of dark shadows. <laughs> um she wasn't in house of dark shadows um and Barnabas, I find, is far less compelling without Angelique in certain ways. Yeah. And um, but in Night of Dark Shadows, uh, did not perform as well as House of Dark Shadows, probably for many reasons. But I kind of always enjoyed it more. Um, what is your thoughts on of, on the one that's featuring um, both David Selby and Lara Parker? Um, I never get tired of watching it. Um, I get tired of the ending once the weird car chase happens. Uh, I was having a conversation with uh, Stuart Manning about kind of the manly, manly aspects of when Dan Curtis takes over. And I feel like there's manly, manly stuff in Night of Dark Shadows that doesn't work for me quite as well. Um, but I love the, the, the spooky, rainy, foggy ghost story aspect of it. I would, I want to see the, I want to see the um, full version, Ansel Farage, swears it's there <laughs> it'll happen um I, I feel like angelique is less interesting as a character because she's not super developed she might be a witch she might not be we're not really sure um in the screenplay quentin tells her we know you weren't a witch i guess they hanged her for adultery um I want to know more about the past sequences. I love their David. I love that Diana Malay gets to come back. Um, it's 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 fun for me to watch it. I watch it probably twice a year, <laughs> usually once around Christmas and once in the summertime. Um, uh, yeah, I want to see the whole thing. I want to see the entire the entire thing. Um, I had read somewhere, heard somebody guessing or or theorizing that before Frid left and before they were, when they were planning to make a sequel that they were going to make it um, about Barnabas. And I always wonder if like, it would have been 1795 with Laura Parker as that Angelique, maybe David Selby as Jeremiah, 
Um, or maybe they would have inserted Quentin into that. That could be fun. I just think the possibilities are kind of endless, but I'm, I'm more or less happy with, with the, uh, <laughs> with the finished product. Um, might have been fun if Laura Parker had ever written a novelization of that. I wonder if anybody ever approached her about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Lara Parker, uh, quite well educated. She studied philosophy and then, um, English and she was a creative writer and wrote a bunch of books. Um, and you've reviewed or commented on those books as well or whatever. I mean, about uh, Angelique's story and backstory. I don't, I think she tries to reconcile the revelation that she is not in fact French, but is in <laughs> fact from um, a New England a resident from the 17th century, which actually makes more sense than Lara Parker being French. Uh, but um, I guess that was sort of a reveal down the line. But um, yeah, what do you it's think? It's all reincarnation. It's all previous incarnations. Yeah. And the devil. Yeah. And the devil. <laughs> the devil can do anything. He can. <laughs> <laughs> I think in her later books, and I've, I've reread them a couple of times, I think that. Oh, she tries to she tries to explain how Miranda Duvall, who is this, according to the show, according to the series, this previous well, it was Angelique was around retconned into being around Collinsport in the 1690s. Even though it makes zero sense for that to be. Uh, I think Laura Parker has tried to make that an incarnation. And then I think that she's the devil takes Angelique and splits her into two pieces. <laughs> so she's a woman and a daughter, and somehow they're actually Angelique. I forget how it works, but um, she explained it in, I want to say, Wolf Moon Rising, <laughs> maybe? Have you read these books? You've read these books, haven't you? Yeah, I yeah. have. Uh, I was just curious as to your, uh, I know the Salem <laughs> branch is fun. She, um, she really has a sense of the characters and what's going on that I... Uh, Except for the hippies. The hippies are weird. <laughs> yeah, well, no one can get hippies. That's the problem. Well, the, the fun thing is that um, you read this. It's interesting because uh, we still sort of talk about Dark Shadows as, and then the modern day, there is no, it's not like they're in the, you know, the 21st century or anything. It's sort of, <laughs> it's all very dated. So it's like, there's almost as much time between us and 60, 1967, as there was between 67 and 1897. And oh, they, so weird. Uh, and so it's all kind of these periods of time or flashbacks and fashions or whatever, except, um, you know, I always <laughs> prefer, I think she looks the best in the 19th century Victorian fashions. She's got the first the sort of kind of, uh, when she comes back at one point, she's wearing sort of the a kind of purplish, outfit blue, yeah purple and green or uh, uh, blue and red it's like blue and red, yeah, blue and red. Um, they and only the give her green. the two dresses though for 1897 she gets the green snake dress yeah. and the blue purpley red mauve kind of dress she gets a traveling dress at one point that she wears i think at the very very end but for for, uh, for her being in that time period as long as she was <laughs> to give her only two dresses is inexcusable Someone should, someone should apologize. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I there's so I mean I do think, and not to rag on anyone who's played the character since, but it's similar to what I said with about uh, the great Arlene Sorkin. They are playing the character this person created. Like this, yeah. Movie. It's not that Arlene Sorkin was the first person to play Harley Quinn. Or Arlene she Sorkin was Harley Quinn. Harley Quinn. And so much of it from her past stand up. And as you said, from, Saturday night, um, from Days of Our Lives. And um, with Lara Parker, I think so much of that sort of regality, that sort of Southern, you can hear it in her voice, it's there. Like, um, and just her style and her humor and everything. And it's everyone, it's just hard to reproduce. There'll never be another, very much like there'll never be another. Uh, Grace and Hall, um, both in uh, as Julia or as Magda, um, I think, uh, and that's you know, it's not a tragedy. It's, not a tragedy. It's, it's it's a great, it's a great thing. It's a great testament to the work. Um, and we have them. I mean, we have them. We can revisit all these things. It's 
<clears throat> I'm wondering a lot about Mark B. Perry is working on this Dark Shadows Resurrection or whatever it's being called now. And I'm curious to see, uh, he was, he guest starred on um, Penny Dreadful's podcast and I listened to it with some hints about what that show will be like. And I, I know it's supposed to be like a next generation kind of a thing. And I'm not a Star Trek fan. And I, I did watch some of that show in the nineties. I don't remember a lot about it. Whoopi Goldberg. I remember Whoopi Goldberg. Um, but I, I am so in love with these characters too. And I don't want them to go away. I would really love it if they would, if there would be a Barnabas, if there would be an Angelique or a Quentin or, a, or a, even some kind of Julia, figure out how to make Julia immortal. And I, I don't even need them like what they did with Big Finish to slap them into other bodies. Like, just bring the character back. I don't know. That could be my old my old fanness, but um, I don't know. I would miss them. I would miss them. There's always there. one of the challenges I know... Uh, Again, Danny Horn did the, the Dark Shadows blog. Please, this is sort of a ritual that can't be recreated. And yeah. you know, my sense was, I don't necessarily disagree. I just, it's never been attempted well. So, yeah. you know. And every uh, time has been, with, I guess with the exception of Night of Dark Shadows, all the other attempts have been to restart with Barnabas, to redo the Barnabas storyline, the the 91 series, the 2004 series, the Tim Burton mm -hmm. movie. And, and they've all done that. And the big finishes haven't. They've continued on with new characters and new stories. Night of Dark Shadows was, I mean, you know, it well, ripped off know, Rebecca again. The series itself would redo Barnabas arriving at Collinwood. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think Three or four times. <laughs> you do that in the modern day. I remember ages ago in the old days of the internet. Um, so shortly I was like, well, you know, I always wondered like why you know that Quentin's a great character. Why isn't he there from the start? And someone was like, no, Quentin comes two years <laughs> in. Like, it's sort of like you have to faithfully reproduce these storylines. <laughs> then you do a ghost, and then you're like, well, no, you have Quentin. Quentin is, um, I don't know if you ever watched the show Smallville, but Quentin mm -hmm. is like Michael Rosenbaum is Lex, that type of character who is, firstly, early on, not entirely villainous, but he's not entirely on the side of the angels, and we kind of... He's a like, rake. He's, he's a rake. A, yes, the rake is a yeah. great character, and you need that from the start, the one who's going to be sort of giving Barnabas the business, and then maybe... <laughs> as, totally! As um, and you need the sort of catty gay man. No one's ever gotten the, the idea. Like, to me, it's sort of, as someone who's adapted... For the stage books one of the things you sort of do is like well it's not just the plot and it's not just what the characters and like what sort of essentializes character what is there and i feel like sometimes it's like oh roger collins just a guy he's a sister of elizabeth and he has maybe sometimes a drink in his hand and they don't get the idea of, or maybe he's a drunk it's like oh, no i mean louis edmonds is incredibly funny and like so many of my favorite life that him having a look or him having, you know, I don't know. He's kind of that kind of brain. archness yeah. that that, yeah. that archness that Louis Edmonds brought. No, and I, and when 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 Danny Horn says that you can't recapture lightning in a bottle, like I get that too, and I don't necessarily need Dark Shadows to be remade from you know the beginning again. I love the idea of let's do let's let's continue it. Let's see, you know, it's been sixty years. What's what's happening now? I just, I just, especially now that um, the actors are starting to pass away. I mean, Chris Pennick and Diana Millay and Robert Rodan and now Laura Parker. Um, I, I would, I would hate. To, I, I, don't, I don't know, but people would maybe disagree with me not to use the old characters again. But Angelic's a witch. Barnabas is a vampire. Quentin is whatever Quentin is. Uh, they can bring him back. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I. I do. I did want to have some Halloween themed discussions with you. This will wound up being a <laughs> very different topic. Um, you know, the one thing I was going to actually lead with, we were going to do the Halloween special and talk about certain movies and stuff was that um, I never really think of Dark Shadows as a very particularly Halloween, like when I think of my Halloween ritual, like things I watch. And yeah. around. I tend to watch it a lot around Christmas. I think that was something, I don't know <laughs> why, um, but or Thanksgiving, and also because um, 
when the DVDs were coming out, the, the sets were coming out, and I was watching them. So that's one of the times I watched the entire series was when the DVDs were being released um, about 20 years ago. And I think one really cool part of 1897, it arrived at, you know, I was getting them at, um, and I, it arrived the day before Thanksgiving. I remember spending the Thanksgiving weekend watching a bunch of them. So I tend to have like associations of it with uh, different holidays than Halloween. And someone had said like, well, every day, in Collinwood is uh, Halloween, so it just doesn't. I mean, even the actual episodes, I do think they're not particularly spooky or stand out. I think um, the week before Halloween of 1967 is the Barnabas turning old and attacking Caroline's plotline, but the actual episode that airs on the 31st, he's not in it. He's already, you know, <laughs> and it's sort of yes, Julia hypnotizing Vicky again and Caroline following him. It's like actually a very dull episode, all told. So, um, <laughs> but um, I don't know. Uh, is there, before we go, is there one particular Halloween movie or ritual or something that's big on? Your, uh, when I was a, when I was a kid, it was. Um... I grew up in the country in a really spooky farmhouse. And when I think back to sort of the generalized Halloweens from like the age of seven to probably 10 or 11 or 12, I remember just spook like emptiness, <laughs> big black emptiness. So not, we would go out and go trick or treating, but um, I think a lot of times we would watch uh, Disney's Halloween treat. Do you remember Disney's Halloween treat yeah. with there would be clips from villains primarily but like night on bald mountain <laughs> with from fantasia the da, 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 and the ghosts are the ghosts are coming out of the grave and like riding goats and stuff um it's really the haunting now the haunting is sort of my uh the 1963 the 1963 haunting based on shirley jackson's novel the haunting of hill house that's kind of my halloween movie my husband and i um we live in a destination neighborhood and we do not like children. And oh. so we will turn the lights off. <laughs> Normally we're at rehearsal. Normally rehearsal for our fall show is how like, we're about to open in a couple of weeks. So we don't, we can't really spare a night off. And in Missoula, since the pandemic, uh, most nice restaurants are closed on Monday. So last year for Halloween, we didn't go out. I think we came home and made something fast and then watched the <laughs> watched the haunting on Blu-ray. And uh, I've seen it so many times that I might have done some kind of a commentary because I think Claire Bloom and Richard Harris do a commentary, but I don't remember. I've seen it so many times that it kind of blurs into my into my. Uh, generalized experience i would say the haunting that's my halloween movie um yeah we have a nice theater here that uh, does um uh, like neighborhood movies classic movies we saw suspiria the original suspiria on the big screen last week which was amazing um my friend amy wants to go watch the shining which i've never seen on the big screen before so i think that that seems halloweenish right slash Trapped in a winter hellscape. <laughs> Very scary. Um, I rewatched the Simpson Halloween episodes and over the course of October and uh, usually culminate with um, Bride of Frankenstein. So, oh, God, and there's so many Simpsons Halloween treehouse of horrors now. There's probably 30 of them, at yeah, least. I I have to always start early. I, I, you know, I do two a day. Sometimes so, uh, I usually at the gym or whatever, and uh, I've had to. What's like, your favorite? Do What's your favorite Simpsons Halloween episode? Um, probably, uh, and I wound up watching it more than once. So I would say 1994. Back when I was in college, it's the um, one with the Shining. So ah! the shining with, and um, <laughs> don't uh, you mean the Shining? <laughs> you want to get scared? Uh, Quiet, boy! Don't get sued. <laughs> And the um, um, nightmare cafeteria where the teachers eat the kids, <laughs> and uh, end up in the middle of that while he's time traveling. And um, close, close enough. Uh, <laughs> it's all, and I think even though my, my wife was like, we will sometimes it's like if you have a very bad day, and you get the little like something is not quite right. Be like, ah, close enough. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, totally. Uh, oh, it's so, raining. <laughs> raining donut. Ah. So yeah, that's one of my favorites. I do like um yeah, but there's it's it's such a wonderful little 
I appreciate it. I'm fortunate enough to be of the age of having been there since the first one. I was like, oh, 16. yeah. I was 16. I watched in it. So uh, you were a little bit younger. So you were, uh, we always had the. I was 10 or 11, I, but we watched it. I remember it was. Uh, the Christmas one, The Simpsons oh, yeah. Roasting on an Open Fire. And I've been a fan ever since though. We watch it. Um, we just watched the Sherry Bobbins one. Tonight, <laughs> which <laughs> Season eight, I'm telling you, it's got Homer's phobia. It's got all these it's great. great um, yeah. I think <laughs> there's a generation of people for whom the idea that The Simpsons was ever controversial, because now it's like, if you're under 20 or maybe even, Getting up oh, there, your parents. They don't know. Simpsons, but your parents like the set. Like it was something yeah. your parents like. It's very. My amazing. husband's mom would let him watch it. Yeah. 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 Too. So it's um it naughty. It was naughty, and but now they're just they are sort of as much the Cosby's, and certainly Homer uh, has a better reputation of Bill Cosby now. Um, <laughs> so it's the actual actor and a fictional uh, character. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Laramie. This has been a delight chatting with you. We should definitely do it again uh, soon. Um, where can people find you out on the internet? Oh, I'm so many places. Everything is really by Laramie Dean. B Y L A R A M I E. D E A N <laughs> by other media. And that's my website. That's my Instagram. Um, my Instagram is silly and fun and stupid. My friend describes it as spooky kitsch. So if that's your thing, if you've been listening to this episode and you like dark shadows and old TV shows, <laughs> come to me, babies. Come to me. Thank you for having me, Stephen. This has been great. Yeah, my Love pleasure. Uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, dark shadows fans and hopefully non dark shadows fans will reach out and look at some of this work. Um, I think it's fun. Uh, you don't have to watch all four years, but some of this, there's, <laughs> there are bits and pieces that are good. And um, thanks everyone. Like, share, subscribe. Uh, we will catch you next time. Thank you, Laramie. Thank you all. Take care. Ha, ha, ha.